Well, thank you so much, Ben, for this wonderful program. And seeing these two films together as a diptych was, was a really um, fascinating, it was, just, it was just really wonderful. But I wanted to begin by returning to our conversation yesterday. And we discussed Trashos Montes as being, at one point, a documentary of the imagination. And it seems to me that that could be one way, that might offer one way to describe these two films, uh, both what they share and what, what, um, uh, how, they, and how they differ. I think, in, you know, this is my land. The way in which you, you allow this world, the objects of Jake's ramshackle world to sort of speak, right, without explanation, but they give us, you know, this is the world that he's invented. Uh, uh, and this, this, is, this is what we're presented to. This is a space we're allowed to inhabit. In the second film, uh, Two Years at Sea, it seems that that similar project has gone ev ev even further, where it seems we enter into this sort of dream space, um, this sort of daydream space. You know, the, the, the photographs seem to, could be sort of memories. This floating caravan could be a dream, you know, and the film has this sort of quality, floating quality of a daydream, which I think is enhanced by the, by the photochemical, the way, the way things sort of blur and, and, and drift. And so I was wondering if we could start maybe by thinking about this idea of a documentary of the imagination in, in these two films. Um, is this on? Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I've not heard that term before, but I like it. I think it's, yeah, I think it is quite apt. Um, you know, because I've always avoided, I, I try to avoid as much as possible um, the term documentary um, because it's so, it comes with so much sort of baggage. Um, but the idea of the documentary of the imagination um, becomes looser with, in, a, in a way that I like because, um, y you know, it, it's, it's not, neither of the films uh, are meant to be um, particularly accurate in terms of thinking about Jake Williams, the real person. Um, you know, it's, it, it's, um, it is an imagined world. It's a, it's a world that sort of, um, well, particularly two years at sea, it does mo move more into um, to like a dream-like space, which is it's somebody, who's, um, somebody who's like Jake, but isn't him. It's, it's somebody who, you know, it's like him dreaming about himself. Um, and leaving out certain things and exaggerating other things. Um, and, um, yeah, I think, I mean, that was one of my reasons for going back because the, the first film was, the, the, the first film was the first film that I'd made which was in any way sort of observational. Mm -hmm. uh, it was the closest I'd done to a documentary. Um, and I guess the films that followed it, they started to, you know, use actuality, like filming actual things as a starting point to move into a more imaginary space. So, um, you know, five years after making This Is My Land, I really felt like I wanted to return to him mm -hmm. and uh, even though his his world hadn't changed, my uh, my way of making films had changed. So I wanted to see, you know, what had happened in that kind of divide. So, um, and and I think that that was that was one of the main things was to um, to kind of make something that was in a way um, more, um, you know, thinking thinking about the film not as a representation of his life, but as as a as an imagining uh, of of, of uh, like a character who's mm -hmm. who's like yeah like him. Um, so, and I mean one of one of the things was that we'd we'd. Um, uh, this is this is my uh, rider. <laughs> this is Ben's request. Yeah. Um, yeah. So th I, I knew that um, we we'd stayed friends after this is my land, um, and 
uh, he'd, he'd enjoyed This Is My Land, so he, he, was, uh, he knew that um, uh, he would be, well, we both knew that we would be kind of comfortable mm -hmm. with this idea of, of making something that was, that, was, um, that was kind of inaccurate, that, mm -hmm. was, um, that, that was a kind of fictionalized version of him. I mean, maybe we could just just to go a little bit further with this. I'd love to know just how then this character was was shaped, was constructed, and what kind of you know, conversation took place in order to make to make this happen. Um, well, you know, it began with me just calling him up and um, and seeing if he would be interested in being in a film. But the, you know, one of the first things I I said was that you know it it. Um, that I didn't, I wanted, to, I mean, I told him exactly what I just said, that I, that I wanted to make something that wasn't um, a documentary, that was, that was more of a fiction. And, and, then, uh, and then when I was there, um, I guess I had certain, at the beginning I had certain scenes that I was interested in. Um, but because it was made over a year, and, you know, I spent a lot of time with him, um, there was a lot of, there were, I mean, well, there's no electricity, so there's, there's the, the evenings are long there. You know, they're lo you know, the long, dark evenings. There's plenty of time to talk. Um, so we, you know, we talked about some of these things and uh, some of the scenes that I was interested in doing. And I, I said I wanted it to start in a fairly everyday kind of way. So the first section is, is the kind of, you know, waking up, uh, having coffee, shitting, showering, um, you know the, the the basic things, and then sort of just starting to sort of shift it into um, in, into a sort of more uh, I guess more more dreamlike space. And and you know I talked to him about um, you know this idea of um, of sleeping as well, which uh, so we you know we just had sort of fun thinking about um, thinking about that idea of um, yeah, because to me, one of the one of the one of the things about this is my land was that it's too it's very fragmentary, and and now when I look at it, it's quite fast. I mean, that might not be to other people, but to me, it's really fast, which captures one side of his character. Um, but one of the th one of the things that um, that I felt was really missing that I wanted to come back to was this idea of. Um, of time and how his relationship with time um, relates to to why I th you know my ideas about his his freedom as a as an individual and as a human in the world um, the the fact that he can kind of take a sleep you know whenever and wherever he feels like and how that might um, you know so that became a, a sort of a part of a, a kind of uh, a structure that I said that I was going to kind of come back to occasionally, um, just to kind of, I guess, to promote that idea of, of um, you know, the, the different spaces of the mind. Uh, Joaquim or, or Dennis? I, I, have, I have a question. How, how have you, how was this encounter uh, between you and, and him? How did it happen? Um, it happened originally um, because I was, um, I, I was actually um, specifically trying to find somebody who lived in the wilderness. Uh, I'd, I'd been reading lots of literature about people living off in the wilderness, and I, and I wanted to, and it was all old, it was mainly old, like late 19th century. Um, Walden like. Walden <laughs> and, and uh, uh, Knut Hansen's Pan was actually more of an influence. And so I went to the north of Norway to try and find somebody who lived like the character um, in Pan, um, you know, but in the 21st century. And to sort of see, see uh, like, what the reality of that today, like, if people were still doing it and what that meant today. And um, so I had this trip up into Norway and, and just driving around asking people, uh, but I didn't find anyone. Um, it was, yeah, it's it was, in the film anyway. <laughs> I think it's there somewhere. But um, 
so I came back empty-handed, and uh, a friend of mine just um, told me about Jake and uh, had his telephone number. And uh, he used to live... Um, he, he, he was his neighbor, but he lived 10 miles away. And that's, that's the way people are spaced up there in Scotland. Um, so, yeah, I just called up Jake in uh, I guess, yeah, 2005, and, and he said, just come on up. And so I just turned up with my camera and not much film, maybe 10 rolls of film. And, um, and yeah, to begin with, I just, you know, talked with him and helped him with his jobs, chopping wood and moving stuff around. And after a few days, then started to bring the camera out and, and film... Um, uh, adequate images, you know, <laughs> and um, <laughs> sorry. and um, um, so it was a very, it was a very sort of natural. I, I wasn't really pushing. Um, so I, you know, he really got comfortable with me being around with the camera, um, and he. he that I mean, that's another reason why I wanted to go back because I know that he's he was very able. Um, to be in front of the camera without difficulty, and um, almost all of Two Years at Sea is is set up, so it's it's directed. I mean, it's based on some of it's based on observation, um, but you know e everything has to be set up, you know, because I want it. I want shots to be a certain way. Um, the camera is still most of the time. The camera is still most of the time, and I'm using I'm using film, which is a kind of precious material so I can't really waste it too much so um, so in in a sense he's kind of reenacting some of his uh, his own actions you know he's acting um, you know and uh, but he does I think he does it very well you know he's very comfortable and um, I get and I think that you know came about partly because we you know we've had this long relationship and he's He's very relaxed with me. You, j just one more question. You, you were talking about childhood yesterday, and uh, I was looking at the film, and now you were talking that you were uh, casting someone in, in nature. Why, why this idea? How did it come to you? Um, uh, well, I think it's been something that has um, been a recurring thing for me. I, I, it, well, I, I enjoyed growing up in the countryside and, um, you know, was, had many solitary hours in the forest next to, um, next to my village and, you know, building camps. And um, so it's not a big leap to think how those things keep recurring. Um, as you as you grow up, that those, those things kind of keep coming back to haunt you, um, you know. Even, or maybe partly because you know I was living in the city, you know. There's this kind of ideal about this ideal kind of dream about what it might be to live in a hut in the woods. Um, so you know, the films partly came about because of that to kind of um, explore. Uh, this ideal in my in my mind, you know, to see if it was real and to see if it was something that I would actually want to do myself. Yeah. <laughs> Dennis. Sure. Uh, I think uh, I would. Uh, <laughs> uh, it was very striking to see this uh, double bill after last night's. Films. I mean, they're all all films that I had seen before, but seeing them in this sequence. I mean, I think again, this is um, you know what programming is about. I think um, there's. T t I was struck by this um, very strong documentary impulse that is at work, but also this freedom in 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 in, in terms of how you treat the real uh, versus you know um, the fictional, um, and. As I was watching, I'd never seen these two films back to back, um, and was very struck by the difference uh, differences in approach. Um, 
but also that they were both essentially uh, you know, portrait films, but extremely unconventional uh, approach, uh, both taking very extremely un unconventional approaches to portraiture, which made me think actually of another Rice Cordero film, which we didn't show, was uh, uh, Jaime. Uh, and this project of you know portraiture by other means, and the idea that you can create a portrait of somebody uh, in that case um, in, their, in that film with an absent subject and in ben 's film with at least in two years at sea essentially a, a mute subject, but you can actually create a portrait by by focusing on the spaces that you know somebody inhabits um, telling a, telling their story with by focusing on the objects they surround themselves with, the environments that they have created and that have in some way created them. So that was something that really struck me today. Uh, I would also just, I mean, I know we want to open it up. I, I'm curious to hear Ben talk more about, you know, the idea of utopia, which obviously is one of the, uh, not to get too conceptual, but <laughs> this is the override, one of the overriding concepts. And I know he has some, very interesting ideas about that, and it's, it's, it's explored in different ways in his, in his films. So. Um, well, um, well, going back to your first, um, first comment, was um, just thinking about the idea of portraiture and um, the uh yeah i mean it, it, it was always it was a it was a it was a challenge that i set myself quite early on um with two years at sea that there was going to be no no dialogue and um e even though in in reality jake is quite a chatty person you know he likes to talk which um we see him talk quite a bit in, in yeah i mean in the first film i mean that's why it's quite nice uh seeing the two together um they i they rarely get shown together so i think that it's 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 nice to see that kind of leap um and i don't tend to i haven't watched two years at sea for quite a long time so it was, it was nice for me to like see uh see that and see um like how things had changed um yeah I really felt like yeah the first film I was really um kind of mm, really making it up as I went along um and, and uh, the, the the second film I, I guess I'm pretty I'm much more conscious about what what moves I'm making and um you know and 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 things like not having him talking and not having other characters in it because he he also likes people coming to visit and that could have been a part of it but um you know i decided that i really wanted um it to be about one one person and their relationship to this landscape this environment and and the stuff the stuff that they've accumulated around them um you know i'm fascinated by his his all this kind of like leftover sort of detritus um that he surrounds himself with and kind of reuses in different ways and you know um find, you know nothing nothing is he would never take anything to like the rubbish dump you know because there's always a possibility in an object which I, I really appreciate and um, you know it's something that in in the society that we live in now is that's very alien you know it's very we, we, we all basically renew stuff all the time and ch throw away anything that is sort of vaguely broken um, so I, I really um, really appreciate that um, but then there, but then there's also and, and I guess this this uh, relates to the the second question you know about utopia and and how um you know the, the, these these films and other films that i've made um you know they're they're about very um sort of subjective versions of utopia you know to some people um this would be a nightmare perhaps it would be very dystopian or um just uncomfortable and cold and dirty um but but to jake it's 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 really working um but then but then as with all utopias they're they're 
they're also impossible. You know, the idea of utopia is impossible. So um, there's always uh, there's all there's always contradictions and and and, and underlying sort of um, there, there's unease as well. Like nothing is. I don't I don't really believe in in like a perfect utopia. So he, even though um, he's he's very happy and he's he's created a world which um, is as close as possible as he can get um, to uh, his his kind of ideal dream. Um, you know, there, there's flaws to it. Um, I mean, what, the the biggest flaw being that he's he's there on his own, and actually, you know, I, maybe he would like a partner to live with. But you know, it's hard to. F how do you go about finding a partner? <laughs> um, you know, he's not. You know, you just imagine the advert in the back of the newspaper. <laughs> it's going to be really hard. Um, so yeah, that, I, I, the, the, you know that you know, and, and other other films that I've made, you know, especially the more recent one, A Spell to Ward Off the Darkness, it's it's a very deliberate way of thinking about utopia as something that is is um, transitory, is 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 something that um, that. Well, as as the word means, it's no place. It's it's something which is um, kind of indefinable and unreachable. But you can kind of make you can try to get there. I mean, just thinking about the the idea of utopia, and, and you know, just in in Trashos Monts, you know, this this faraway place, this land, where you know myths and legends continue to resonate. At the end of the film, there's this is hint of sadness, or more than a hint, this is this resonant sadness and sense of, you know, departure. And, and that's similar to the mood that I get at the end of, at the end of this film, you know, where we similarly dissolve into night. And it's, it's, it's incredibly, I find it incredibly moving. I mean, there, this is Dennis's great term, you know, portraiture by other means. Here we have this sort of pure photochemical image, which is sort of flickering and, 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 and dying. But I'm wondering, just thinking about the two films, you know, in the first film, you know, he's so industrious, he's so busy, he's so, you know, and it's clear you could have just continued to follow him, you know, going around constructing. And, but in the second film, you do, we get this sense of, of sadness, the photographs that especially come into, into play here. So I was wondering, you know, in what ways was this, you know, something that, you know, you spoke of, you, you know, very clearly about how, how this wasn't an accurate uh, portrait. But in what way was that your invention? Which way did you did you uh, um, pull this out, you know, and, and and construct this as a as a as a narrative? In what ways is that your sort of anxiety, or, or perhaps your own sense of or auto critique of this idea of, of utopia, if you will? Um, I think it it does is partly what I was. Um, I guess it feeds from what I was just talking about about thinking about. Um, the reality of the situation. I think when I when I was first there and making this as my land, I was I was just full of joy about this place and this man, and um, it's. It, I think it was much more kind of like um, celebratory and fast and just uh, more just more energetic. Um, um, it was it was feeding on those things that I got from him, but I, but I think you know I spent a lot. Well, I got to know him a lot more, and I spent a lot longer making Two Years at Sea. Um, and yeah, I think maybe I was a bit more acutely aware of of some of the some of his own sort of sadness, or and maybe 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 mine as well. Like I I think it, you know when I think about the beginning of the project being about me uh, being wanting to find out about this dream of living in the forest and then five years later sort of realizing that even though it is a dream and one that I still like a lot I, you know I don't I also find the idea of, of um, sort of absolute solitude um, a pretty hard idea, you know, one one that maybe I don't want to experience, um, or you know, can experience in in doses, but not 
all the time. And um, I don't know. Um, I I I um. I think I found the box of photographs when um, about halfway through making the film. And uh, it was actually, Jake had gone off for a couple of days um, and I was just staying there on my own and looking through his stuff. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, found, found a box of photos and, and, and then this one particular set, which was just uh, eight or nine photographs, black and white. Um, and very evocative and just uh, mysterious. Uh, you know, I, uh, I had no idea like, who these people were, um, what their relationship to Jake was. Um, and I started to imagine all these, these past scenarios based on these photographs. Um, so I knew then that I, I wanted to include them in the film and, and to, you know, to not explain them so that the, the audience experienced them, them in the same way that I experienced them, um, you know, as, as kind of mysteries and, and clues to some kind of past. And as soon as you think about the past, I think the, uh, like the past in photographs is always tinged with a, with a sense of melancholy. It's, uh, it's it's somehow unavoidable, even if they're happy memories. That they're, they're, there's 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 this innate melancholia, which um, which I felt like was was somehow really important to have have in the film, and and then um, and the final shot was was something that um, that I was pretty clear about. Um, from fairly early on, I think it was it was uh, it was something that I uh, um, it just was I don't know. Sometimes you just have images that are, are burnt in your brain, and you have to get them somehow. Um, and uh, yeah, even though it was, it, I I knew that that's how I wanted to close the film. It, it I didn't actually film it until my last trip there in the winter, um, and it was. Uh, I think it's yeah. That's I did four takes as well. So that's four fires, four four tires. Um, tires. Tires. Yeah, you know, a, a car's worth of tires. <laughs> <laughs> well, just they oh, burn really brightly. Well, I don't know, this is and and toxically. Uh, because in fact, the the photographs bring. Uh, as Victor, thank you for being here, Victor. Uh, as Victor uh, said yesterday about uh, Antonio Reis, the, the sense of loss, of, of uh, separation. Uh, and it was really, really moving because it gave to the film a kind of depth uh, that resonates uh, even after, after, after the end of the film. And the, the last shot with those photographs behind, it's, it's amazing. Thanks. Yeah, I just, the question of Utopia and, and thinking of the photographs as well, I mean, this film, and I think this points towards the film we're going to see next as well, The Turin Horse, you know, this, I feel like the photochemical itself, there's, there's a real elegiac quality to the film and this last image where the, I love the way the dance of the, of the dust on the film seems to be the spark of the fire that's, you know, and, and the way in which you've, you've, the photochemical is so vital in this film, the way in which the image literally pulses and dances and the way in which it's so willfully organic in the same way where this world of, of you know, the woods and, and nature is, it seems to me that you know, all of that has this quality of, of coming to an end because of where we are now. I mean, this... Mm -hmm. Just to create this print was actually a great like, yeah. <laughs> achievement, you know, uh, and and a, diff a difficult thing to do. So I was wondering if we could just just discuss a little bit of this, you know, what it means to make this film in on widescreen, black and white, <laughs> you know, and call and 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 to be so much a meditation as well on on the photochemical, on a certain mode of cinema that is drawing coming to an end. Yeah, um, I mean, 
Yeah, I, it's, uh, film has, has been my medium since the beginning, and I, uh, that that comes out of you know um, wanting to make things. I I, I made. Uh, I enjoyed making stuff. I mean, it kind of goes back to the childhood thing again. I enjoyed making stuff when I was a child, and then that moved. I went to art school, and I made things. I made sculpture, and um, you know. So when when I started making films, it was inevitable that it was that it was film and not video because I think it you know it was something that I could still like hold. Um, uh, and and hand processing was was. W was this in another kind of sort of revelation for me that that I could that I could actually process it myself and that it would the film kind of retains the the sort of the the marks of that particular history as well of of me um sort of processing in my kitchen sink and hanging up in the bathroom and um you know and there's you know there's been so much talk uh about the you know the the, the death of of this particular medium um, um, the 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 digital has is it's inevitable that it will supersede it um, without thinking that they're, they're two very good mediums that could exist alongside each other that that, that for various reasons um, film should disappear um, and uh, and I think that became more acute when I was making this film. Or at the beginning of making this film, Kodak um, said that they were going to stop making um, Plus X, which was the film that I shot it on. It is a type of black and white film stock, which I'd shot probably half of my films on up to that point. So was, I was very sad about that, obviously. Um, so, I, um, so I bought um, I bought everything I could. Um, not just from Britain, I was had to call up Kodak, you know, in, in lots of different countries, and and there were people in Kodak trying to like pull in these last bits of plus X for me. Um, so in a in a sense, the film is also an ode to one a, a particular medium. You know, it's like a make of of paint, or um, you know whatever. It's it's a it's a specific. Um, um, kind of material which is now gone um, so um, so I think that you know I really wanted that to be um, you know somehow embedded in the film itself and and like you say it's it's not it's it's uh, to me it's it has an aliveness like every every frame every frame is different because of the grain and and then uh, you know when when you hand process it's you know it's not machine done so it's it's irregular and it's, so that also uh, kind of accentuates this um this sort of the uniqueness of of each image um and and to me that that mirrors um the, you know Jake's world, you know, which is which is um, is very it is very alive. It's very um, you know it's dirty. Um, you know, the, the, and and there's a, and there's a lot of um, yeah, it's uncontrolled. There's a lot of accident. I think that's really important. There's there's accidents. There's there's um, there's a kind of unknown and and um you know the and these these accidents or mistakes sort of inform the way the next move you're going to make in life um and um you know i don't i don't think i could have done that i mean i i'm you know if i if i was using digital hd whatever that um it's just too it's too clean and too dead for that, I mean, for that particular kind of world and and the the ideas that I'm thinking about, I think it's it's not it doesn't work. They they're too opposite. Well, it seems. I mean, first of all, to speak of this, as the place is being dirty. Or I mean, that's not really at all the image that we get from this film. I think partly because of, largely because of the black and white. And I think you know, one of the things this film gives us, where we really allows us to inhabit that space and not be sort of pushed away you know in, in 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 any way and so i think that that's the the sort of you give us a kind of gift of solitude in, in essence through the film you allow us to 
to daydream, to drift with, uh, with, with this extraordinary man. Yeah, I mean, I th I, yeah, that's true. I mean, it's black and white. The, all the, th the techniques I'm using, they're sort of forgiving. They, um, they uh, sort of merge these things. I think that's another thing that I was aware of. That when I first went to film um, some tests for the feature, uh, I shot some color as well. And the color, even, even using color film, seemed to... Um, uh, too harsh. It, it showed t too much sort of detail in a way. Um, yeah, I, I really I wanted it to the whole image, every the whole world to be much more kind of um, uh, sort of precarious mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and painterly too, to a certain extent. Right, are there other comments here? Or should we should yeah, we take right. questions? Yeah, let's take some questions, preguntas, comentarios. Hi. Hello. Okay, uh, sorry for the banality of my question, but I was just wondering um, if you got the panoramic format already on the shooting or only on the post-production? It's, uh, it's on the shooting. I'm, I'm using... Um, if, if, if anyone didn't quite get that, it's to do with the, the format of the... The ratio of the of the film. Um, Wide screen. Right? Yeah, it's it's. Uh, I'm using anamorphic lenses, which uh, they squeeze um, twice as much information into the the square shape, and then you use a similar lens to stretch it back out again. So it's it was always framed as that kind of. But it, ratio. it was only 16 millimeters. Right? Yeah, it's shot on. Um, okay. um, yeah, just the. The pragmatics where I, I shot on a, um, a, a 60 millimeter on a, a half of it's on a Bolex and half of it's on a Arton. Okay, and I was also wondering about like um, when I saw the film, I had the feeling that the main idea was actually his loneliness and how his opportunity to be free was leading him really to this loneliness. Uh, but uh, when you were talking about it, I felt that it was like something peripheric and not central on your speech. Um, but I really felt that the film was about the process of losing this strength. And in some way, it, it reminded me the film that we're going to see afterwards because uh, I thought that it was very as much the, the same idea about like losing strength and at some point we are almost losing it, but then we make some strength to keep mm -hmm. going, but at the end, everything is gone, even the light. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if it was like a central thing to you or not, because I didn't have this feeling now. <laughs> I mean, I think it's important to remember that, um, uh, like I made, I made this film, um, but you shouldn't necessarily listen to my reading of it. I mean, because, <laughs> I, you know, I'm just one person. Uh, I, you know, I like the idea, um, the kind of films that I like and the kind of films that I want to make that I don't, you know, I don't want to be like the authority on them. I, you know, I want, um, I want there to be enough space in them so that, you know, there is no one correct reading. Um, so if, if if that's how you feel about it, then, then you know, that's, that's great for me. <laughs> a question in the back? Oh, was it here and then in the back, sure. Hello, good night. Uh, thank you for the movie. It was very inspiring. Uh, I wanted to ask you other banal questions, like, uh, it's just, uh, as I said, it's very inspiring and it's very, I think it's very hard what you did to make this movie in 35 millimeters. So I wanted to ask you to tell us how you managed to uh, do it in, uh, with money and how do you, exp uh, what, what do you expect for the movie? How at theaters, at regular theaters, they're not gonna show it. So, what's the 
life expectancy of this movie. <laughs> and sorry for the question. Uh, well, um, I mean, I'm, very, I'm um, you know, very uh, optimistic. So it did, I mean, I, uh, it was funded by, I, I get a lot of my funding in Britain sort of more from uh, like art, the art world funding systems there um, rather than conventional um, film funding. And, um, and so, uh, yeah, the, I, I got a, a grant to make a, a longer film. Um, I mean, I can tell you how much it was. It was £35,000, um, which is about €36,000 um, at the moment. And, um, you know, one of the ways I'm able to do this is that I work very small. I mean, it's, it's just me and a, and a sound recordist. Um, and that's it. Um, you know, I, I do the camera work and I process the film and, um, uh, you know, edit it and, you know, so I keep it very small. So that obviously means, um, it, you know, I'm not paying, having to pay people's wages. And, um, so that's, uh, you know, and it's very important for me to shoot on film. So uh, that's that's probably one of my main expenses, you know, plus um, paying Jake and taking lots of really nice food and whiskey. Um, we, we drank some fine whiskey. Um, but, you know, my, my expectations, um, I, get, I don't really think about them, actually. When I'm making a film, it's, I think it's really dangerous to think about, um, you know, where, where something might go, how many people might watch it. Um, you know, in a, I'm, I'm not, obviously, I'm not that worried about numbers. If I was, I wouldn't be making this kind of film. <laughs> um, but I have been surprised by it. I, in, in Britain, it was released in normal cinemas. Um, you know, it had a national release, which was great and um, surprising. And, um, and, uh, and it has also been distributed in, in the States, in cinemas and, and, and France and Spain. So um, it's, it's done okay for a film that has no talking um, <laughs> and is black and white. And yeah, all the rest has a very long shot on a lake, um, which I was happy to hear some people sort of uh, laughing, trying not to laugh during that. Because to me, that, that shot is funny. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of Samuel Beckett and, and you know, that is funny. <laughs> um, but yeah, I hope that answers. Thanks. I mean, just to also point out the film, when it was shown theatrically, when it had a release, it was shown on DCP. You know, it wasn't shown on, on 35. This is a, a print that we had specially struck, so the film exists on, on film. The, the, uh, the, the Spanish distributor is also, was also very um, strict. They wanted to show on, on film as well, so that's great. But in Britain, um, you know, most of the cinemas had got rid of their 35mm projectors, so DCP was the only um, choice for that. Uh, thanks for, for the courageous uh, experience and for the film to keep in memory. And uh, I was curious about two, two things. The uh, first one was, uh, did you put to yourself some questions of existence? Uh, because in a, at a certain time, uh, we have a perception of death. And afterwards, um, you come back to the landscape and to many things. And uh, it was for me as... I was in doubt if it was like a kind of uh, existence in eternity, seeing from a, a transcendent point of view, or if it was uh, a view of times lived before. Uh, and my second uh, curiosity was about your collaborator, Black Cat. Did you have a name for him? 
And uh, how, for how long uh, did you were uh, shooting until you could catch that scene of he, he was cleaning himself uh, <laughs> until he was looking directly to the camera? I was this a prodigious uh, achievement. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I mean, yeah, I, I, I was thinking. Um, it's hard, you know. It, it, yes, I was thinking about existence. Um, <laughs> I think it's unavoidable, and it it becomes, uh, you know, when you have the space and the time to be alone with yourself, um, that's when you really um, have a chance to think about. Uh, I mean, it's sort of unavoidable to not be existential in a place like that. Um, you know, I I live in the center of London, where you have less time. Um, you know, it, 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 it sounds ridiculous in a way or obvious, but you, life just kind of moves and you kind of go along with it. And, um, you know, so um, you, you almost don't stop to, to really um, just think about your being in the world. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think, you know, that film, you know, this film is, is, is partly about that. It's about how, how time can allow for that kind of reflection of, um, you know, just, just uh, you know, what being, being in the world. And it's, um, you know, maybe sometimes sort of transcendental, but, you know, I also have, you know, it's kind of, goes back to what I said about Beckett, you know, it's tinged with irony, um, it, in my case. Um, and, um, oh, you know, like absurdity, you know, the kind of, the absurdity of, of um, existence. And, um, and the cat was called Gizmo. And uh, I don't, Gizmo is a character from um, the Gremlins, movie, 80s, Joe Dante, Joe Dante. Um, sort of com comedy horror, um, and um, yeah, no, I, I spent a lot of time with the cat, and um, you know, a bit like, it's, uh, you know, it's a bit like um, the time that I spent with Jake as well, you know, we spent a lot of time together so that he becomes so relaxed with me, with my camera, that um, that he you know he almost forgets that I'm there or well he doesn't forget that I'm there actually no he definitely doesn't forget that I'm there but he's just relaxed with the idea that I'm filming him and that I'm asking him to do things um, and and you know cats are very strange creatures and they and they they're they're also quite solitary and and difficult and um, they're not like dogs which are just like love me. You know, they don't care. Cats really don't care. Um, and, and so, yeah, it took a lot of time to just um, get Gizmo, you know, relaxed. And, um, and then when I was making that shot, I was just kept shouting her name. Oh, really? <laughs> you know, Gizmo! Gizmo! <gasps> and, um, you know, and then sort of reluctantly, she sort of, you know, looks up. You know, it's really, it's really nice. And it was, I knew it was, um, it was gold. Thank you. There are two situations in the movie that in the middle of this insulation, we have two scenes of more insulation. That is the, the river, the lake, and the caravan above in, in, the, in the tree. Uh, I have questions, I have curiosity about the caravan in the tree. First, if the, the, the scenes were part of the normal life of Jake, uh, and uh, if they were arranged, and uh, how did you sign Jake to enter in the plane again, in the shot again? <laughs> 
<laughs> did you, or it was natural for Jake to, it was natural? Oh, to float and then push himself. Push yeah. in, inside of the shot. Thank you. Um, it, uh, well, the, yeah, so the, both of those things were, were, thing, were, were, um, were, they, they were things that I wanted to do. Um, they're not things that he would normally do. Um, but then, but in a way, he, he you know, the, they're not so dissimilar to what he might do. I mean, he, he does like, um, going for walk, long walks and just being in that landscape. Um, and he, he had been talking about making a tree house. Uh, so we just, you know, took it another step further. Um, and um, um, trying to think of the question, but the boat, yeah. Well, um, I mean, it was partly I, that's what I wanted to happen, but it was also there was chance involved. I, I mean, I framed it so that you just can't see the the shore, the the land, um, and. Um, you know, so, uh, and um, we'd, he'd gone out on it before, so we knew that the water was drifting very slightly that way. Um, but, yeah, I, I mean, I didn't know it was going to definitely happen. I mean, I, and, um, uh, yeah, I mean, but it, 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 it happened, and then, uh, and, and um, you know, it just happened just at the, at the, at the, at the right speed, exactly the right speed that I wanted. I don't know, it just, um, everything came together that day. We'd, we'd actually filmed it all um, the day before as well, exactly the same. Um, uh, but it was raining more that day and, uh, you know, so the, it wasn't, the, the water wasn't able to become this kind of mirror, which is, um, you know, something that I was very happy with. I mean, the way that I make films, there is a, you know, there's a certain degree of, of um, chance or quite a large degree of chance involved. And um, sometimes uh, the world just gives you uh, these kind of gifts. And, um, you know, I think that's one of them. But yeah, I, 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 I like the idea that, you know, it, it, it obviously, you know, I think everybody thinks that, he, that the shot will last as long as, you know, he's going to drift out of the screen. And, um, you know, I like the idea that he sort of gets to the edge of the frame and kind of, he's not, he doesn't want to leave the film. <laughs> so he kind of pushes himself back in again. It wasn't the end, no. No. Why you uh, chosen these f two films to begin the this session is the question. So the uh, films of, of Ben Rivers of and no. Trash of Moons. Yes. Yeah, and I mean, why the? To me, again, this this idea of dialogue. It seems that so many of the issues that we discussed last night are directly relevant uh, to to this the film. You know, I was I was just thinking of asking you know Ben to speak about this. You know, we talked last night about how Reish and Cordero's camera. There's a certain ethics to that camera, the way in which the this the film describes a kind of respect of the subject, and the way in which the film, by fully entering into the world, by shaping the film around, the, the film takes a form of of this sort of imagination, and I think that that's very very similar to, uh, to Ben Rivers' work, especially in these two films. But also, I think, the idea of time in the films, like entropic time, the sort of slow time, the sort of deeper time, this time that's related, in which the past is a sort of glacial force that's sort of pushing and sort of defines the present, you know, the, which seems to be rushing by, but there's also, the past is also moving. I think that that's something that, you know, entropy, that, that idea gives us, a sort of geologic time. I feel like that's something that we see, you know, in um, two years at sea. I mean, the very term itself, this idea of sea, this sort of immensity, the space that we don't 
right, actually see. It's not a real see, but that's, to me, this idea of, you know, what um, Gaston Bachelard calls intimate immensity, the idea that this, a type of infinity can be contained within the intimate. That I think that's also, that, that, that ties into this idea that this sort of, this deep time, right, can be contained within a single moment, within um, a, a work like, like this. So this different concept of time, and we think of, you know, cinema as being you know, 24 frames per second, so much of like sort of modernist cinema was about acceleration and speed. We've come to a new concept of cinema, which I think begins, you know, I think maybe, you know, I haven't traced a sort of genealogy of it, but a film like Trust Just Monts points to a concept of time that's so important today. You know, in the age of digital, so many, so many filmmakers are interested in slow time, this different kind of, of cinematic time which I, is also though tied to different, is given way to different sort of meditations on, on history, like if you think of the, word, the work of uh, Jia Jianke or, or uh, Apichapong, um, where is Ethicanol, where it's also about the imagination too. So to me, and then to, I feel like the concept of utopia is, ties into that, this idea of creating a different world, a different time space. That, I've, and I feel like you know the work of Bellatar is also about that too. Although there, it's it's blown and buffeted by the winds of more sort of dystopian <laughs> forces that and, that threaten and, and menace it. So I feel like these it's not like a neat formula, but the, those these concepts can be seen as one way to I think unite these works and also to really reflect on cinema and film and film history in interesting ways. But I feel like. Um, I don't know. I mean, Dennis, is this something you want to expand on? Because I know we've been we've been sort of talking about these these these, these different ideas and and yeah. I uh, I think the point about the it's interesting that you mentioned landscape, which is something that I thought we should also at a certain point talk about landscape, nature. Um, we you know this idea that um, with Reich and Cordero finding the you know the the proper as we say, distance, or you know, the the right, um, this calibrating this this the correct ethical stance towards their subjects. Uh, I think it applies not just to human subjects, but to the land. Um, and how do you film uh, nature or landscape, and and have it not merely be picturesque, uh, and have it to you know have it. I think that's maybe something that Ben, you know, uh, I think you, Joaquim, you talked about it too, about like not trying for poetry, but about having poetry arise incidentally or, or, or through, a, through, a more, through a more direct or, or modest means. Um, and um, I think this, again, relates to something, you talked about this, um, the idea of, inf what's it, infinite? In, inf intimate. intimate immensity. Intimate, sorry. You also said earlier um, this, and I think this relates to nature again, is um, in introducing Ben's program, um, the intimate sublime, right? I think you said something. I think the sublime is also a, a useful concept to think about uh, in terms of nature, because with Jake, it's not, you know, he's, um, it's a solitary existence, but he's, he's alone in nature. I mean, so there's, you know, he is, um, I love those scenes in the films where it's like, it's, he's, it's, he's, he's, it's almost like a merging of the self and nature, where he's like, you know, the, he's in the, the scene of him asleep, and the fact that it's like nature is sort of creeping in into all aspects of his, of his life. And, and the concept of the sublime, I think, has a lot to do with um, this contrast between the, the small and the infinite, the, uh, the fact that we are, you know, the sublime often referring to, I think, a sensation that is too large to, to really understand or to contain or, or apprehend in some way, and I think, uh, which is why it's in a very romantic sense has always been associated with, with nature. Um, so, that was... Besides, when you discuss the question of utopia, which is the, in fact, in these three directors, the question of the collapse of ideology, and uh, this idea of entropy and utopia connected, has to do with the, the fact that society hasn't anymore uh, an ideological solution to, to, to present. So it, it is as if these films are a kind of post-ideological utopias uh, that sink in entropy. 
Uh, so when when Antonio Reis puts the 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 wall of China by Kafka in in Trazos Montes, uh, he's already talking about this, and I think you are doing the same with this kind of retreat from urban life and in Bellatard the collapse of community is it's evident. So I think we are in the shadow of of the collapsing ideologies. Uh, and that was very important for the definition of the of the title and the directors of the program to answer to your question. And I think there's just one more dimension, which I think is the sort of utopian ideas of cinema, I think, you know, which these, these films both, I think, uh, uh, eulogize, uh, expand, and also uh, uh, um, challenge in really, in really fascinating ways. The idea of, you know, the very idea of documentary itself, right, is having a sort of utopian idea that one can explain and understand the world through, right, with the camera as a sort of tool. Um, it seems like this, you know, the more poetic, skeptical, respectful, like, I think, uh, uh, stance of these, of these artists, in, in this, I think, it's most especially Reese and, and Rivers, I think um, oh, really, I think adds, adds a whole other, whole other dimension. The idea, though, that the, the photochemical itself has is, a, is temporal, like the emulsion itself, the grain itself, I think, to me, I find fascinating the fact that as or something organic, it is, in fact, decaying, you know, I think is also uh, of so much part of the poetry and poignancy and power of, of cinema. So I think that's also another sort of mode of, of, of entropic time. It could, in fact, be applied to Portuguese cinema, this concept. <laughs> and I think that the world has, has caught this idea of, that is in Portuguese cinema for so long, this idea of, of slow time. Uh, so the world finally uh, is synchronized with Portuguese <laughs> cinema. <laughs> well, speaking of synchronization, uh, we have a screening at yes. 7 o'clock of The Turin Horse, so we, we hope to see you all there. But for now, please join me in thanking Ben Rivers. And Dennis Lim. <laughs>